Ford maintained rigid centralized control as his business grew because he was determined to capture the benefits of standardized procedures and economies of scale. His control system was based on detailed measures of every element of his operation. Ford sweated the details, and his management systems reflected it. Today, Ford's principles of operational excellence are applied in industries as diverse as retail, brokerage, transportation, credit cards, and, of course, manufacturing. Walmart, for example, has built a supply process that integrates product flows from the supplier's factory all the way through to the store shelf. Walmart, Charles Schwab, Southwest Airlines, Federal Express, Taco Bell, and AT&T, all icons of operational excellence, know their activity-based costs and their transaction profitability. Their discipline is evident in their value propositions to the customer and in their operating models. If Henry Ford were to run an operationally excellent company today, he'd have to update his principles somewhat. For all the pluses of his operating model, he would now have to take into account today's enlightened employees, efficient transactions, information technology, and service-intensive work. Let's look at each area in turn. Operationally excellent companies run themselves like the Marine Corps. The team is what counts, not the individual. Everyone knows the battle plan and the rule book, and when the buzzer sounds, everyone knows exactly what he or she has to do. The heroes in this kind of organization are the people who fit in, who came up through the ranks. They're dependable, like the FedEx driver who delivered the Denver-bound package before 10 a.m., in spite of the snowstorm that forced the plane off the runway and the truck into a drift. For the operationally excellent company, a promise is a promise. For the company's employees, dedication is paramount. These companies aren't looking for free spirits. They want people who are trainable. They'll hire them and teach them the Walmart or FedEx, UPS or Southwest way of business. At McDonald's, the store manager knows and takes pride in the fact that the company president rose up through the ranks. He started just as the manager did, flipping burgers and scooping fries. At McDonald's, as in most operationally excellent companies, what's important is not who you are, but what the company has made out of you. The employee of the year? That would be the best team player, who will get his or her name added to the plaque in the employee lunchroom. Peer recognition is the best compliment one can get, and the plaque itself, inexpensive, inclusive, and public, symbolizes much about the company's culture. Avoiding waste is what the operationally excellent company is all about. When Michael Dell visited the headquarters of Compaq, his principal competitor in the PC market, he walked around and looked at all the marble in the building lobby, all the rich furnishings. Then he went home and told his staff, we can beat these guys. One look at the Dell headquarters and you know this PC company hasn't wasted any of its capital on office space. Similarly, Nucor Steel takes pride in the thrift signaled by its having sited its corporate headquarters in a Charlotte, North Carolina strip mall. The point is that people at operationally excellent companies don't feel deprived by eating at restaurants without white linen tablecloths. They don't expect expense accounts to include a night at the Ritz. Motel 6 is more their style. They disapprove of ostentation. That's why operationally excellent companies can reward their employees not with big cash awards or broad empowerment, but by putting people in the limelight, often accomplished with an instant photo glued to that cheap plaque. The visible pat on the back goes a long way toward cultivating a workforce that is highly motivated and dedicated to the value proposition of the organization. Since the time of Henry Ford, the impact of technology has been immense. Information technology, for example, has automated routine tasks and coordinated activity through better communications. The impact on manufacturing productivity has been awesome to the point that in many industries, transaction costs, administrative expenses, and overhead have dwarfed production costs. As a result, every operationally excellent company strives for low overhead with efficient re-engineered business processes. A revolution in transaction efficiency has swept nearly all businesses. This has caused a major revision of one of Henry Ford's guiding design principles. The founding Ford believed deeply in building tightly integrated processes for the production of automobiles. He linked auto assembly to sub-assembly manufacturing, which was linked to component manufacturing, which in turn was linked to materials production. Eventually, this logic led forward to almost complete vertical integration. Steel mills, glass factories, even rubber plantations in Brazil, all to create a single threaded manufacturing process. Ford used his management hierarchy to coordinate all of these activities, which coincidentally lowered transaction costs between activities. 
More recently, however, companies have found ways to achieve even greater efficiency, not by vertically integrating, but by virtually integrating. Today, operationally excellent companies view themselves and their suppliers and distributors not as discrete allied entities, but as members of a single product supply team. Streamlining the connections among team members eliminates duplications, delays, and even payment complications that come from arm's length handoffs. Customers consult with suppliers to ask, why do we both inspect product quality, outgoing in your plant and incoming in ours? Why do my accounts payable people and your accounts receivable people duplicate each other's work? Why do I spend so much money on distribution centers, trucks, logistics, and warehousing capabilities when you have them as well? Can't we cut those expenses in half? Why don't we figure out a way to make product flow freely with maximum efficiency from your company to ours? Supplier Procter & Gamble and retailer Walmart ask one another those questions, and then they turn purchasing and supply tradition on its head. Now, product flows from P&G to Walmart more smoothly than between internal departments in many companies. The agreement Walmart made with P&G set new standards for every retailer's logistics arrangement with its suppliers. Like Walmart, other operationally excellent companies have redesigned the transaction process between themselves and their suppliers. Purchase authorizations, purchase orders, and backorder notices have become nearly extinct in new continuous replenishment processes. Bills of lading, receipt notifications, and shipping manifests, which add unnecessary costs to the flow of goods between companies, have disappeared, along with paper invoices and many of the clerks who process them. This continuous replenishment concept is a simple one. Suppliers assume the responsibility for managing customer inventories, which in return allows them to smooth the flow of goods and lower their own end-to-end -end costs. Everyone wins. The operationally excellent company purchases lower-cost products and unburdens itself of much unnecessary work. Walmart, a pioneer in creating these cost-cutting relationships, today uses an electronic data interchange system to send daily sales data to suppliers. The supplier's computers integrate this data with, for instance, warehouse inventory information and sales forecasts to generate a new order if one is necessary. It's not just paper and its processing that such new arrangements cut they slash distribution and transportation costs as well. The goal of integrated logistics, as the concept is broadly called, is to move product from maker to user in a single step. It treats the outbound logistics systems of the supplier and the inbound logistics system of the customer as a single integrated system. No time or motion is wasted, and no money either, on moving products in and out of intermediate warehouses. The philosophy, product that isn't moving, isn't being distributed. Again, Walmart offers an admirable example. It has developed a system of cross-docking in which two sets of trucks, one coming from supplier factories and the other set heading for stores, arrive simultaneously at a company loading dock. Workers move the product from the first set of trucks into the second, avoiding lengthy warehouse storage altogether. The product then heads to its final destination with no costly rest stops along the way. This concept is known as flow-through or one-stop logistics. Tupperware Home Parties has similarly revamped its logistics operation, eliminating the distributors who warehoused inventories for dealers, who in turn ordered and picked up product for Tupperware Party Hose, who only then delivered customer orders taken weeks earlier. With today's integrated logistics, dealers place orders by dialing with modem-equipped PCs into Tupperware's mainframe computer. Factories then ship via UPS directly to the dealer, party host, or customer. The last step in the buying process between customer and supplier is billing and payment, and here, too, operationally excellent companies are exploring a new notion, invoiceless payment. In other words, they're eliminating the bill. Again, let's look at Walmart. When a customer buys Procter & Gamble disposable diapers at a Walmart store, the checkout scanner records the sale and orders a credit sent to P&G. There's no need for intermediate steps. Ford uses a similar process. When a supplier shipment arrives at a Ford assembly plant, no one at the dock checks to make sure the freight matches the invoice because there is no invoice. Instead, a receiving clerk at the dock checks a computerized database of purchase orders issued by Ford. If the shipment corresponds to an outstanding purchase order, the clerk accepts the shipment and enters a confirmation in the database. The computer automatically cuts a check, which is sent to the supplier. Payment authorization takes place at the dock, not in accounts payable. As a result, Ford has been able to reduce by 20% the number of clerks in its accounts payable department. As remarkable as these achievements might seem if viewed from, say, five years back, today's leading-edge practitioners of operational excellence have moved way beyond just reducing transaction costs. Imagine, for instance, that you're in the cereal business, 
and you get a call like this one from a major nationwide retailer. About this cereal of yours, the caller says, we've got some questions for you. We've examined the box and done a cost analysis of the contents. It looks to us like we're paying $3 for about 20 to 30 cents worth of product. Packaging might add another dime, which makes a total of 40 cents. We're wondering where the $2.60 difference is going. We don't understand. So we'd like to sit down with you to see if we can figure out how to kill the monster in your operation that's swallowing so much cash. That kind of discussion is going on throughout the business world. Operationally excellent customers are invading their supplier's domains. McDonald's, Ford, and Walmart, among others, are bent on achieving efficiency through the entire product supply process, even when it means stepping into someone else's fiefdom. If you do business with one of these companies, you'll achieve operational excellence in your own corporation with their help, or you won't get their business. What makes operational excellence necessary is the new competition. What makes it possible are the new computer information systems and networks, which play a vital enabling role in the creation of operationally excellent processes. Companies exploit today's low-cost, high-performance technology to increase coordination and control over their entire system and to speed and streamline individual tasks. Information systems have become not only the nervous system but also the backbone of their operations. Because technology is so important in operationally excellent companies, one usually has to look inside the company's computer systems to understand their core business processes. The systems and related databases and applications are so highly automated that they don't just track the process, they contain and perform it. For example, at FedEx, anyone who deals with the movement of a package, driver, sorter, customer service agent, uses the same package record to coordinate the work. At Hertz, the service agent at the airport counter, the technician readying a car for rental, and the agent who checks the car back into the parking lot all enter and extract data from the same system. The power of information technology is especially evident in industries like securities brokerage. Charles Schwab has brought to that business an entirely different operating model, built on a sophisticated base of information systems. As a result, Schwab's cost structure is so much lower than Merrill Lynch's or Smith Barney's that it can make high margins while charging less than half the price for stock transactions. Further, because its systems communicate buy and sell orders directly to the floor of the stock exchange, they can execute trades and confirm prices while the customer is still on the phone. Traditional brokers are probably still writing your orders down on slips of paper. They'll have to get back to you. It's not that Merrill Lynch and Smith Barney don't want systems like Charles Schwab's. Goodness knows they spent enough money trying to build them. It's just that these companies don't adapt well to the organizational demands that information technology makes. Without organizational discipline, or centralized, regimented, and standardized structure, a state-of-the-art computer system won't give a company comparable success. The information contained in integrated computer systems is useful not just in the core operating processes. Operationally excellent companies are passionate about measuring and monitoring to ensure rigorous quality and cost control. They generate detailed data with which to make management decisions. Operationally excellent companies have aggressively pursued mobile technologies to extend their control and to improve customer service. The handheld computers used by Hertz, FedEx, and UPS employees are examples. Companies like L.L. Bean and Land's End have driven teleservices technology to new levels of sophistication. What these companies find at the leading edge of technology is better operational efficiency and control. Today's operationally excellent companies have revolutionized their business in another dimension that Henry Ford never imagined, customer service. Poor service can add substantially to a customer's total cost through wasted time and frequent errors. Operationally excellent companies return this lost time to customers. Most companies that buy from other companies maintain large accounts payable staffs not because they can't redesign the process to automate payables, but in essence to insure themselves against the inaccuracy of their suppliers' invoices. Consumers, too, maintain the habit of always spending some portion of their busy lives correcting others' mistakes. The rule for operationally excellent companies is, if you truly want to have the lowest total cost, make sure your service is effortless, flawless, and instantaneous. To do this, operationally excellent companies have redesigned the customer service cycle, aggressively streamlining the selecting, ordering, receiving, paying for, and maintaining of a product. Just think of how much easier the car rental process is today than even a few years ago. Hertz number one Club Gold members record their car rental preferences only once. 
When they place an order, either through Hertz or with a travel agent, all the information Hertz needs is already entered. Club members encounter no lines or delays at the airport. They get right on the bus and are dropped at their cars. Hertz automatically bills their accounts at the end of the rental. No fuss, no hassle. That's the standard of basic service in an operationally excellent company. One of the main keys to achieving operational excellence in customer service is the same as in manufacturing. Do it one and only one way. Here again, variety kills efficiency. Another key is getting customers to adapt to the operationally excellent company's way of doing business. McDonald's provides a classic example. Your mother couldn't get you to clear your dishes, but McDonald's did. When underneath the golden arches, you expect to follow some implicit rules. Bus your own table, stand in line to give your order, know what you want when you get to the front of the line. Don't ask cashiers to hold the pickle, take it off yourself. McDonald's has built a whole system of social norms that patrons readily enforce among themselves. Of course, customers comply only because they get low prices and efficiency in return. Likewise, Southwest Airlines makes a point of not providing food, advanced check-in, and baggage handling. It explains that such frills preclude low prices and impede reliable service. Customers have bought the message and adapted their behavior accordingly. Going on a trip? Pack lights as Southwest because you'll be carrying it. Hungry? Grab a bite before the flight. Just arrived? Step into line for a boarding pass. Why are operationally excellent companies uniquely qualified to deliver superior basic service? Because they enjoy three advantages. The first is focus, making hassle-free basic service a key part of their unmatched value proposition. Second, their operating models support efficient zero-defect service. The practices of operationally excellent companies are part of the rule book for zero-defect service. Third, they have effectively exploited information technology to redesign their basic service tasks. Information technology has made service available anywhere at any time. It is the catalyst of the service revolution. As operationally excellent companies create an unmatched value proposition of best total cost, the question comes up, what's in it for them? There is only one answer, growth. Other market leaders might raise prices to exploit their product advantage, but such a tactic runs counter to the operational excellence strategy. Walmart could raise its prices a measly 1% tomorrow in an effort to add $800 million to the bottom line. But it won't. If it raised prices to exploit its current advantage, it would merely be stealing from its future success. Higher prices means less value leadership. Less leadership means lower growth and ultimately shrinking margins. Operationally excellent companies obtain their growth in three coordinated ways. They work to assure a constant, steady volume of business so as to keep their assets continually working. They find new ways to use their existing assets, and they replicate their formula in other markets. Let's take these growth generators one by one. Having invested heavily in stores, plants, airplanes, or other fixed assets, operationally excellent companies know that using those assets as many hours as possible every day boosts both revenues and financial returns. They also know they must smooth out demand fluctuations as much as possible to avoid inefficiencies that come from a boom and bust cycle of volume. Consequently, they strive for large, consistent volume throughout the day, the week, and the year. Demand peaks and valleys become operational problems to be managed because nothing undermines efficiency and hurts low unit costs faster than slack in a system. Machines sputter to a stop, workers cooler heels. In short, fixed costs keep adding up while no product flows to pay for them. Two pitfalls, however, plague demand management aimed at keeping capacity utilization both high and steady. The airline industry illustrates one. Yield management has introduced so much complexity into that industry that it may be increasing costs, not lowering them. The airlines hurt themselves by using different kinds of aircraft for different kinds of routes and by offering different fares to attract different kinds of customers. Remember, variety, even variety in price, destroys efficiency. The second pitfall is that using price and promotion to shift demand can teach customers to withhold buying pending a special deal. When that happens, demand actually becomes lumpier. Walmart sidesteps this pitfall by rejecting promotional spending in favor of everyday low prices. Promos, ads, and sales are the brain children of product marketing people who don't understand the monkey wrench they can throw into retail operations. No wonder companies like Kellogg, General Mills, and General Foods 
rank far down the list of operational excellence. Their behavior saps efficiency. A second way that operationally excellent companies fuel growth is by finding different markets to penetrate with their existing assets. Recall how McDonald's created a breakfast market. Aware that much higher profitability would flow from filling its restaurants at more than the lunch and dinner hours, it launched a campaign to convert the hamburger crowd to born-again breakfast eaters. The idea was to get customers to drop by first thing in the morning for a cup of coffee and an egg McMuffin. With the success of the campaign, McDonald's boosted the utilization of its fixed assets, its restaurants and equipment, to 10 to 12 hours a day from just 6 or 8. This doubling slashed unit costs and overhead and gave a big lift to the bottom line. FedEx took another approach to growing demand while shrinking the idle time of its assets. Its planes once flew almost entirely at night and sat unused most of the day. FedEx contacted L.L. Bean, which at the time was shipping its clothing and camping gear by any available carrier. FedEx offered to take over all of L.L. Bean's shipping. Urgent deliveries would still take to the air on the night schedule, but the rest would fly by day, using the idle planes. This arrangement, FedEx argued to Bean, would both take up its own slack and give the retailer faster service. Bean agreed, and a partnership was born. The other route to growth for operationally excellent companies is through replication, transporting an efficient, standardized service to a new location. Walmart has one formula, FedEx another, Southwest Airlines yet another, and the buying public firmly associates those formulas with the company's brand names. So once that formula is defined, perfected, and widely known, an enterprise can fire up its cloning machine. When it opens a new outlet, a company doesn't have to slog up a steep learning curve. It simply replicates the processes it already performs. Nothing repeats like a success. McDonald's expertise in opening new restaurants around the world, something on the order of more than a thousand a year, contributes substantially to its remarkable success. In countries like China and Russia, where most people once thought a hamburger was someone from a certain German city, millions now know and love the familiar Big Mac formula. The more than 9,000 U.S. restaurants are now complemented by almost 5,000 golden arches around the globe. Formula replication can work well not just in the service sector, but for product businesses as well. Highly successful New Course Steel, for example, replicates its mini-mills in various parts of the country following the same layout and procedures. Toyota and Honda have transferred their efficient methods and even their management style using virtually identical designs and procedures from Japan to Kentucky. Although the workers are American, the plants run on the once foreign-seeming Japanese model, and nothing seems lost in the translation. What, then, distinguishes operational excellence from operational competence? Hard choices. Less product variety, having the courage to not please every customer, forging the whole company, not just manufacturing and distribution, into a single focused instrument. The operationally competent company will shy away from these tough calls and pay the price. A canny weave of unparalleled know-how, technology application, and tight management, that's what makes a leader in operational excellence. The secret of succeeding with this value discipline is summed up in a single word, formula. Formula often has a negative connotation, but for operationally excellent companies, it's the foundation for an aggressive and highly successful enterprise. Chapter 5. One Company's Experience. AT&T's Universal Cards. So intent on efficiency was Paul Kahn, the first president of AT&T Universal Card Services, that by the day his operation began in March 1990, AT&T computers had already screened most of the U.S. population for creditworthiness. That meant that AT&T phone reps could instantly approve cards for any caller who could be matched in the database. We didn't need any other information, he says. On that first day, AT&T reps, based in Jacksonville, Florida, wrote out a tsunami of calls and the database matched the vast majority of them. Says Khan, the card was issued the next day. It was out of the door and in their hands in a week. Competitors often took a month or longer to issue a card. With such operational excellence, Khan would permanently change the rules of competition in the credit card business. His idea, simple to describe but hard to execute, was to run a lower-cost operation that would deliver guilt-edged service, unheard of in the credit card industry. The story of Universal Card, which we'll illustrate with the help of a roundtable of comments from Khan and several current employees, shows in detail the power of the operational excellence value discipline. 
by building a new business on the discipline, Universal Card leaped in a matter of months to market leadership. So efficient was its new operating model that it prompted fierce competition in the industry. The competition in turn squeezed profits and spurred consolidation. The top 10 card issuers in 1986 had a 33% market share by card volume. By 1993, they had increased their share to 40%. What prompted AT&T to think it could rush in and establish a winning business? Partly the juicy profit margins. Retail banks then ran most credit card operations, and historically, credit cards had been the bank's most profitable product, returning up to 5% on assets as compared to the 1% typically earned by a well-run loan portfolio. Khan was bent on taking a big bite out of those profits. Also drawing AT&T into the fray were changes in technology. New non-bank competitors could install inexpensive off-the-shelf computer programs. In essence, they could operate like the Walmarts of the credit card industry, undercutting traditional providers with a radically lower cost structure. AT&T also bet it could build business by leveraging brand awareness, which hardly existed in the credit card industry. Half of credit card customers didn't know that their cards were issued by one of 6,000 organizations. To them, it was just a MasterCard or Visa. AT&T had a venerable name to offer. Perhaps most important, AT&T could see that customers weren't satisfied with the cards they had. Card users didn't like the high annual fees, and with one or two exceptions, they didn't like the mediocre service they received. Many people were downright angry about surly phone representatives who took weeks to process a simple change of address or stolen card bureaus that couldn't issue new cards without embroiling customers in a tangle of paperwork and phone calls. AT&T figured it could deliver much better service. The world was changing in 1989 in a way that would hurt traditional issuers with or without the coming of new competitors. Their customer base was finite and their product was mature. All of a sudden, card issuers couldn't command high fees while delivering lousy service. Their customers were ripe for a better offer and AT&T made it. AT&T bet right. The AT&T Universal Card Services operation was profitable in 27 months, way ahead of schedule. Today, it's the second largest banking card in the industry. Over 20 million domestic cardholders, representing receivables of over $11.1 billion, use it as a combination long-distance calling card and general-purpose credit card. They get the same benefits they would with other premium credit cards, but with no annual fee, low interest charges, and a discount on long-distance telephone calls. Recounting the UCS story, which began just over four years ago with a concept team of 35 people, is Paul Kahn, its first president, who has since become president and CEO of Safeguard Services. Joining Kahn are four current employees, Jim Kutch, vice president of computing and networks, Linda Plummer, a senior manager of customer relations, Daniel Patterson, a member of the bilingual team of telephone associates, and Bridget Waters, a member of the consumer protection department. When AT&T brought the universal car to market, it had laid plans to succeed twice over. For starters, it priced the card lower than any other available. It was free, and the low interest rate could save heavy users hundreds of dollars a year. Customers jumped to get such an appealing card to slip in their wallets. AT&T followed up with a no-hassle responsive service that got customers to pull the card out of their wallets more and more often, and competing cards less and less. By getting people to acquire and then use the card regularly, AT&T met its key objective of capturing a high share of the outstanding credit card debt. AT&T had loosed a world-beating formula for ravaging the business on almost all its rivals, and it took competitors years to figure that out. Here's Paul Kahn's perspective. He says, let me try to bring the Universal Card story into focus. When we launched the card, we launched it with a very clear, simple marketing message. No fee. Free for life. Our statement was very powerful. We combined a calling card and a credit card that lets customers get rid of the two cards in their wallet and substitute one. We simplified life. But we also added value. Every time customers use the card for long distance, they get a discount. I think the key to success for AT&T Universal Card was running an operation according to the basics of quality, service, value, and treating people decently in an environment that allowed them to be successful, particularly while our competitors didn't have that environment. That gave us a competitive advantage. Unless you have a new product, 
unless you have a new positioning, you've got to worry about how to get competitive advantage. We did that by running an excellent operation that delighted the customer with superb service. As time went on, because we had variable interest rates, our rates kept dropping with the prime rate. Our rate dropped five times over two and a half years, while our competitors' fixed rates stayed the same. Every time the prime dropped, we would tell customers. We would tell prospective customers to transfer the balance from our competitors to us to save money. We kept hammering home a simple message. Value, quality, service in a company you could trust. We provided excellent service by designing everything that was touched by a customer to be better. That meant gearing our people to handle customer problems by phone, not to ask customers to fill out lengthy forms. It meant eliminating errors in our paperwork processes. It meant streamlining the process for delivering cards. It even meant mundane things like redesigning our statements. We designed the statement and then redesigned it again to make it easier to read and easier to send in payments. Whenever we found a problem, we fixed it. We maintained a continuous focus on fixing anything that went wrong. Achieving perfect quality, no errors, is not only doable, but it's a valuable competitive strategy. For example, every month we took in 8 million payments. If we had a 1% error rate on those 8 million, that would mean that 80,000 customers a month would be upset. They would be upset that a payment didn't get posted to their card, or that they got a late fee, or that interest was charged. That's an unacceptable number. 80,000 times 12 equals a million customers a year who would get upset over one of our processes. We started out with a 99.8% error-free payment processing rate and got to 99.9%. Our service platform was also designed to be faster than our competitors. For example, we wanted a turnaround time of three days from the time customers called us to the time we had a credit card in the mail, and seven days for the card to be in our customers' hands with the average postal delivery time. We met that goal, except for a couple of startup months when the volume was overwhelming. Our intent was to design a system to delight the customer, not satisfy, but delight. If customers had a problem with the card or a change of address, we changed the address online instead of sending out two more bills with old addresses on them. Most competitive companies in the United States today are geared towards customer satisfaction. They haven't looked at the tremendous competitive edge you get by delighting customers. History now shows that AT&T's universal card services formula was a winner from the start. Customers were the first to realize it. The competition took longer. For months after the card's launch, other card issuers heard the same marketing messages from UCS as did everyone else, and they heard the same reports of stellar universal card service. Still, they remained dubious and hesitated to react. What they couldn't seem to hear was the sound of UCS busily sawing the legs of the structure that supported their obsolete business practices. What finally got competitors' attention was the sucking sound of market share rushing south to UCS's Jacksonville, Florida headquarters. Although most card issuers would get returns of 15 to 20 percent on their direct mail campaigns, UCS got a phenomenal 40 percent according to Khan. As the months clicked by, the evidence became overwhelming that UCS was gobbling competitors' shares. Says Paul Khan, we had American consumers moving from our competitors to us. Our competitors waited for two years to react, so for two years we took market share. Our competitors never got it back. They thought we couldn't sustain our success. They thought we were a flash in the pan, but we were not taking share. We were taking their best customers, and they realized this trend was going to break them. They kept getting higher-risk customers, and we kept taking the lower-risk customers. They didn't understand that we had done a paradigm shift. Operationally excellent companies like AT&T Universal Card Services depend for their success on processes honed to deliver high levels of reliability at low cost. The processes may include issuing cards, changing addresses, or correcting billing mistakes. Standard operating procedures, practiced over and over and tested rigorously to isolate glitches, keep the costs of each of these procedures down. Note that companies like AT&T Universal Card Services don't ask their people to make up new rules as they go along to deliver great service. They ask them to follow established procedures that over and over again have yielded the hassle-free, unexpectedly good service that customers value. Says Paul Kahn, our focus in lowering costs was to cut out waste and errors. 
according to statistics, 15 to 20 percent of any industry's costs come from error, from recovery from error, and from cleaning up mistakes. So we decided that waste was where we wanted to cut costs. We were not going to re-engineer in the way some companies are doing it, which is just to lay off a bunch of people. We were going to drive out errors and drive out defects. That's how we were going to lower the costs. Then we'd either pass the savings on to the consumer or put it into our bottom line. And frankly, we did both. That's why we could offer the card with no annual fee, drop our interest rate, and still come up with profit margins that were equal to those of other people in the industry. We didn't want to lose customers either. As everyone knows, it's a lot more expensive to get new customers than to keep the ones you have. In our business, it takes a year and a half to get customers profitable. At that point, the longer you keep them, the more profit you make. In fact, it's about $35 a customer in annual profit. So we wanted to keep our voluntary attrition rate to a minimum. And in fact, our attrition rate at UCS was less than 2% a year. Citibank's was 15%. So they lost a customer that they basically had a six or seven year life with. It's too soon to tell, but AT&T certainly hopes for a much longer tenure. Our attrition rate was partly determined by how we handled customer complaints. Because we took an approach of delighting customers, we had about 200 customer complaints a month coming in, whereas we had 2,000 customer compliments. That's pretty good performance because American consumers do not like to write compliment letters. They typically write only when they're irritated. Says Daniel Patterson, I try to give the same level of service to everyone. There is not any one person to whom I give better service. The extraordinary is really the ordinary around here. I was recognized with an award after I took care of a case that involved a couple that had flown to Mexico. The wife fell off a horse, broke her hip, and required surgery. The doctors in Mexico would not accept a credit card, nor does medical insurance here transfer over into Mexico. So the couple was in a bind. With the help of a co-worker, we were able to reach the doctors and tell them we would deliver cash on the spot if necessary. After we faxed some information, they accepted the card. Following the surgery, everything was fine. We helped the couple get reservations for their return home. That was a great feeling. The heroic is part of everyday work. Says Khan, let me give you another example. One Saturday in September, back to school time, we had a computer failure. The failure was at one of our vendors. As a result, about 40,000 of our customers were turned down when they went to use their credit card to make a purchase. Now, that's not a very nice experience, particularly if you're in a restaurant trying to impress some friends and the proprietor says, sorry, this card is no good. What was worse was that some overzealous merchants, about 200 of them, actually took the card away from the customer and said, I'm sorry, we have to take this card away from you. Merchants get a $50 reward if they retrieve a fraudulent card, and a few decided they had an opportunity to make some money. So here we have a lot of dissatisfied customers. We didn't know anything about it until customers started calling at about noon on Saturday. But we had developed an infrastructure in our company for that kind of thing. With our online systems, we could find out in short order that there was a trend going on. What did we do about it? We got to the vendor and got him working on the problem, which took about four hours to fix. We also put out an online message to our reps instructing them when any customer called to first apologize for the problem and second find out where the problem took place. If the customer was at the merchant, the reps were to get the merchant on the phone and authorize the transaction. If the customer was not at the merchant, then our reps were to get a merchant's name. They were to tell the customer that we would call the merchant, apologize on behalf of them and ourselves and tell them what the error was. On the following Tuesday, we had management swing into action. I sent out letters with my signature to 40,000 people. I explained what happened, said it was a computer error, that we were very sorry we had inconvenienced them, and that we were going to make sure it didn't happen again, and that here, please accept a $10 gift certificate to use in any way you want. The next month, we got more compliments than we had ever received before. People were not used to being treated that way. But we had positioned ourselves differently, and the way we reacted showed that we meant what we said. It really solidified our relationship with our customers. Companies that derive their success from operational excellence live or die by process improvement, governed generally by the principles of total quality management. AT&T Universal Card Services is no different. It constantly polishes its standard operating procedures to cut costs for itself and cut hassle for its customers. Says Paul Kahn, 
we developed a process called continuous improvement. In fact, it became a core value of our company. Whatever we're doing today, we can do better tomorrow. Inside the company, that approach diffused negative emotional reactions. Typically, you criticize somebody for making a mistake. Instead, we took the position of saying, you've done something wrong in the spirit of continuous improvement. How can we do this better the next time? We always try to be forward-thinking, asking, how can we get better? We made a quality improvement process a little bit of fun. We actually stole an idea from the FBI and we created a 10 most wanted list of quality defects. Every department at UCS had a 10 most wanted list that it put up on a wall. Teams were assigned to work on each item on the list, and when they corrected one of those defects, we would have town meetings with every employee, and we would bring the teams up and applaud them and give all of them ceremonial plucks. At any given time, we had about 125 major quality improvement projects going on, all of which had teams assigned to them. When one improvement project was retired, the next one went up on the list. It was a continuous process. If you ever get complacent and think that you've achieved high quality, then you're really out at the end of your quality journey. One of the things I did was create an environment that forced everyone in the company to be closer in touch with our customers. Every manager in the company is required to listen in on customer service calls two hours per month. None of us were competent at handling them, but we had to at least listen and understand what people wanted. In June 1990, three months after we launched, we thought we were pretty hot, I have to tell you. We had just worked out our telephone problems, and we were pumping out cards like crazy. But we benchmarked ourselves against the Baldrige template, and we found that we scored only 150 points on a 1,000-point Baldrige total. It was a rather humbling experience to me. When we won the Baldrige Award in 1992, we scored somewhere between 700 and 750 points, which is where you win the Baldrige. So in three years, we had moved up significantly. Enabling AT&T Universal Card Services' success is information technology. No surprise. Real-time, hassle-free service in today's world comes only through the speed and integration of computers and databases. Not only is AT&T Universal Card Services highly automated, however, Computer systems essentially define people's work. They proceduralize it. In effect, the system manages the process. According to Paul Kahn, we used technology very much as a competitive weapon. What we wanted was a high-tech, high-touch environment. We started with a database of all customers in the United States so that if you called up and we had your phone number, bang, we could map you against the database, have you profiled in front of the telemarketing rep before he or she ever answered the phone. Our phone response rates were immediate, as opposed to two, three, or four seconds. By cutting that wasted time, we could afford to give more service to our customers. Says Jim Kutch, we draw an analogy between UCS's computer screens and those of a modern jet fighter where many of the lesser functions are automated so the pilot can focus on the main job. We want to do the same thing, taking care of the little things behind the scenes, providing the right tools and facilities so that our telephone associate can bring full attention to his or her conversation with the customer. Says Khan, every transaction we looked at, every time we touched the customer, we tried to figure out how we could do it better and faster. For example, we used expert systems so that ordinary people with no credit experience could grant credit line increases. We made it simpler. UCS is now on its fourth iteration of this workstation system, so that gives you an obsolescence life of hardware and software of about one year to give you an idea of how we try to keep a competitive edge. Says Kutch, what we have evolved is the UWIN workstation, our customer service delivery platform, our PBXs, local phone networks, our call management system, our 800 services, our network, all of these have also been advantageous. We think our database analysis is particularly powerful. We have collected data since the launch of our product and have details of every transaction. This gives us a tremendous asset for reviewing and improving our operations. The other tremendous asset at AT&T Universal Card Services is a motivated workforce. The company has managed to accomplish what few other companies seem capable of. It has created a high-spirited attitude in people performing routinized work. Its approach has been to hire eager people with a lot of potential, 
train them to view excellent service as routine and assemble them in teams to solve problems that lead to continuous improvement. The efficiency of UCS, like other operationally excellent companies, also stems from a high degree of role specialization combined with broad integration. Consequently, associates, such as those on bilingual telephone teams, can handle or find someone nearby to handle most problems. UCS's formula for managing people builds a degree of organizational strength that most competitors find unassailable. Training helps people perform. Performance boosts self-worth. A sense of worth builds employees' loyalty to the team and the customer. The benefits of this self-reinforcing approach to management shows up in happy customers in a robust set of profit figures.